It is one of the most isolated places on Earth. A remote outpost in the Pacific. Thousands of miles from the nearest continent. And it is home to a martial art that was kept secret, outlawed, and nearly vanished. My name is Terry Shepard. I'm a Green Beret sent on combat and training missions around the world. But I'm part of a long line of elite warriors tested in battle. And the only way to reveal their weapons and tactics is to experience them myself. Yes! I'm about to search for the heart of the Hawaiian warrior. You may think of these islands as paradise, but deep in Hawaii's past is a surprising warrior culture. Today, the secrets of that culture are closely guarded, and I'm about to witness something few people get to see. Look at these guys. This is an ancient greeting, meant for a visiting chief, both to honor and to challenge. What they're doing is also finding out what your intentions are. Why are you here? You know, and if you come here with good intention, they honor you. If you come in here with something else, they're ready for an attack. Man, I don't think I've ever seen anything like that. I felt like a wall of power coming at me there. Yeah, we call it manna. And that spiritual energy put out by the warriors actually goes feet in front of them, you know. So we have a bunch like this. It extends 30, 40 feet, and you can feel it in your body. And your hair stands up on your neck, you know. And that's uh, the mark of uh, a warrior. But to truly understand the Hawaiian warrior, you must first understand the concept of mana. In Hawaiian, mana loa means the great power. It is a spiritual force of supernatural origin, a power that flows through all things. Mana can be placed in a person, uh, a place, a holy shrine, or a thing. So mana it, can, can, it can be in things too. It can be in things, yeah. Mana is an underlying concept of all Hawaiian way of thinking. It is a spiritual force, a life force. And that spiritual force is transmitted into a unique and absolutely brutal martial art. This is Lua, an ancient Hawaiian martial art. And it's also known as the art of bone breaking and joint dislocation. That's a back break right there. Yeah. The secret to Lua is to let the enemy make the first move, then knock him off balance with paralyzing nerve strikes. In fact, the word Lua means to strike the second blow. I'm stepping into the circle of death here, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> they know what's coming, I'm sure. <laughs> Go straight, right? So I come in. I, oh, nice. Boom. Done. That was <laughs> nice. You would be making a huge mistake <laughs> if you underestimated this guy. You think, oh, come on, what could he do? He just crushed me, and he was nice. Can we walk through that slowly sure. so you can kind of point out what you do? Sure. We unbalance you first, and then go straight to the joints or to a vital spot. Boom. So I'm good with the C block. Right away, you yeah, can he's, see. He's twisted. I'm, I'm out in big of position. trouble. Right? I'm the, I can't counterattack so much. Nope. I mean, that's, okay. yeah. It would, it would be difficult, you know. And if he comes in with his right leg as well, oh, yeah. Much better. Even better. And boom, look at that. Right there. If you get hit, right there. Here, anybody who's done any tie boxing and you get these kicks, it just shuts down the leg. Oh, done. Done. This is really a deadly form of self defense. So deadly that during European settlement of these islands, the practice of Lua was outlawed and it was forced to survive in secrecy. So here I come in. Here you come in. 
Oh. Come, Gina. How about this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> luckily, luckily, I didn't get hired for my looks. <laughs> so, what are, you, what are you guys laughing at? <laughs> but the takedown is just the beginning. Once immobilized, a Lua warrior could methodically dislocate or break every bone in a victim's body. Okay, so if I'm coming to you like an idiot, yeah. hey man. First thing you do is grab it. <laughs> oh, right there. And, and you may not realize how attached to pain a little finger is. Yeah, yeah. when he was that and bends back, I, I, I'm giving up. That <laughs> really hurts, man. Okay, now, so he's moving up the chain. Now he's got my wrist, and now he rolls it over. What happens is when he takes that joint over, I've got to follow it. If I don't follow it, I'm breaking the joint. So I'm going to go right there. He's got it. Oh, I hate that one. He just broke my arm. And down I go. It's body mechanics. It's basic body mechanics. Bodies are supposed to bend some ways, and some ways they're not supposed to bend. So this is how these warriors could kill with their bare hands. And it's this martial art that will dominate these islands for centuries. The islands we now call Hawaii are colonized in the 4th century. And for 900 years, these first Hawaiians lived mostly in peace. But that's about to change. Because in the 13th century, warriors from Tahiti arrive on the big island. They bring with them warfare and human sacrifice. The islands form into separate kingdoms. Conflicts erupt throughout the island chain. The region has been transformed from peace to war. And that transformation is about to create an amazing warrior culture. One with a type of skill I've never seen before. I think every culture has used a spear, but the Lua warriors took it to a whole new level. And what made these guys great was what they did when one of these was coming straight at them. This is Hawaiian spear catching. Nice, man. In ancient times, when a Hawaiian chief called an ali'i would come ashore in war or in peace, the locals would throw at least one spear right at him. Your, your mana or your power as an ali'i and your worth was measured how well you did with the pairing or catching of the spear. Wow, so right then when you get on shore, right then. you're tested. These warriors are members of a Lua fighting school called Apa, and they're going to show me how to eventually run straight at an airborne spear. Even if you block them, sometimes it's still going because of the momentum. Yeah, it's right, right, because yeah. it's still on that trajectory where it's yeah, going to get you. Yeah, okay, so okay. It's got to go on the off, off, yeah. offline. Yeah. Offline. Offline. Yeah. Yep. And learning the basics helps both mind and body, because facing down even a training spear is really about controlling fear. The better, the better ones I did were the ones that I didn't really think too much about and I just did like this. As soon as I started thinking about it, you get a little slower. The greatest warriors could dodge, deflect, or catch up to 12 spears at a time. And these are training spears. The real ones were sharpened to a deadly point. But for me, just catching one is a big challenge. You ready there? Yeah, yeah let's okay. go. Pretty good, actually. That's all right. <laughs> I got lucky. You could have been the other way. I could have went like this. Bam. So that's how you get good, man. Train. But deflecting and even catching spears isn't enough. To really succeed at this task, I've got to run directly into a hail of spears. With, with that theory, I guess I guess we'll have to make an honorary member of our PA. <laughs> <laughs> I got a long way to go for that. <laughs> These guys are being nice. It's, you know, it's fun to be around guys like this. These are kind of my kind of guys. You know, you you have to have camaraderie in a fight because you got to know the guy to the left or right of you. It's going to protect you. You know, you got to care almost more about your guy to the right and left and your buddies than yourself. And that's kind of what this is training, man. Go, 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 go. 18th century, the Hawaiian Islands have endured five centuries of intertribal conflicts. 
but a new warrior is coming. One who will end the warfare and radically change Hawaii's destiny. And to truly understand this warrior, I'm going to experience an ancient test of bravery. I jump out of planes for a living? That looks freaking crazy. A remote outpost in the Pacific. A land born of fire and water. Hawaii. But what you might not know is that Hawaii is home to a unique and absolutely fascinating warrior culture. Their fighting style was considered so dangerous that it was outlawed. Now, I'm getting a rare look into one of the world's most secretive warrior cultures. Hawaiian warriors used activities like surfing to test their strength and courage. But they had a sport that was even more dangerous, holua. With this sled, they could basically surf down a mountain. I jump out of planes for a living? That looks freaking crazy. Yeah. But this is much more than an extreme sport. Holua is so dangerous that it was considered a type of ritual self-sacrifice for warriors. As a test of bravery, Holua riders hurled themselves down slopes more than a mile long. How important was this to them? It was very important because it was a way of proving their value, their worth, this is just grass, but they did it on rock. Right. You know, groomed right. stone pathways, and the whole point was to make the bottom. The average Papaholua sled is 12 feet long, but only three to six inches wide. It could travel over 70 miles per hour, and everything on it is built in pairs, emphasizing the Hawaiian concept of duality and balance. Have you ever done anything like this? No. Okay. Should I, should I do something? Should I, should I go slow? No, you should just go for it. That's what I'm that's saying, man. That's... Hey, you want to experience what warriors were like in the old time here? This I'm is in. it. I'm in. Have fun. In the bottom, brother. cool we got to make him go faster but hey something else too i want to point out too that tom did for me is as he cut his hands doing all of this work working all of these knots and doing all of this and he got blood and what did he do right in front of me he put blood on both handles which is to increase the mana right to, yep. to, to get us some spiritual power if you really want to understand what holua is holua actually means to be two together this is one this is two yep. Awesome. Ah. Several times when I was riding it where I wanted to bail, where I felt like, oh, I can't correct it, I can't make it, I can't make it. And every time that I fought through that urge to bail and get off of it, the ride got better. Like, usually from about that first half down, it got better. Palua sledding is over 1,000 years old, but it says something important for a modern-day warrior. If you're going to be a fighter, if you're going to be a warrior, you got to conquer your fear and you got to commit if you don't do either of those things, you're going to lose. And in the line of work that we do, if you lose, you die. Holua sledding was a public display of bravery. Waka waka. But training for Lua, the martial art of these warriors, was closely guarded. And many of its secrets were hidden inside rituals. Well, what you're doing is performing the dance of the boar god, Kamapua. I'm with the boar god. The boar god. So you'll see the man as he transformed from human into the demigod himself. Part ritual and part storytelling, this is really a war dance. And a really harnessing power here. Just pushing this out. Everything you see, every move they have transmits manna. 
Every move also hides a fighting technique. That's an elbow smash. Elbow smash is showing the guy how much of a warrior he is. Blocking. Absolutely. And there's one warrior trained in this martial art who will change these islands forever. His name is Kamehameha, and he is destined to bring peace through war. At the time of his birth, priests throughout the islands predict the coming of a killer of chiefs, a man who will have a great destiny, and even the goddess of fire will come to his aid. 1786, Kamehameha is the chief of the northwest corner of the big island. But before he can conquer the rest of the island chain, he must dominate his home island first. At the time, this region had no metalworking technology. So the source of Kamehameha's most fascinating cutting weapons was the sea. Look at this. This is death. Did you hear that? And it cut all the way through, like a razor. Kainoa, what is this weapon? This is called the Leo Mano. Mano is Hawaiian for shark. Made of shark teeth inlaid in native hardwoods, the Leo Mano is the primary cutting weapon of the Hawaiian warrior. And the most deadly teeth for this weapon come from the tiger shark. With these teeth, the shark can bite through even sea turtle shells. And in a Leo Mano, the angled points and serrated edges cut through human flesh right to the bone. When you pull, right. it really tears skin, muscle, flesh, sinew, everything. So this is really you're mimicking the action of a tiger shark bite, where he goes in and he saws through you, just lacerating all sorts of vital stuff, and you bleed to death really quickly. As if that's not bad enough, <laughs> what's coming out of here? It's uh, the end of a marlin bill. So you have a real dynamic weapon. Think about that, you hit, he's bleeding, and then the finishing blow come in like this. I mean, quick, easy, guy's bleeding to death right in front of you. Hawaiians believe the mana of the shark would transfer into the weapon, giving the warrior the animal's ferocious power and speed. You probably didn't see that. Let's walk through that slow. I just got cut twice on major life-threatening vessels. So the first one, as I come in, he channels me. Look at where it goes. Bam! Cut right there on the thigh. And that's. I'm going to think about that for about a second before he rips up and takes out my groin. And if I'm still up, <laughs> whatever he wants to do to me. I'm gonna have a bad day. That was probably like two seconds. And my life ends on the beach just like that. I've never seen a place look like this on Earth. I mean, it literally, it's like an alien landscape. This is Kilauea, one of the most active volcanoes on Earth. And this volcano will play a surprising part in Kamehameha's quest. Seventeen ninety, Kamehameha's control over the Big Island is growing, but standing in his way is his cousin Keoa, who controls the region to the south. And in a battle for island dominance, two forces meet in combat. Kamehameha has the upper hand and he presses Kaua's forces into a retreat. But that retreat takes them right next to the volcano. It's here that the gods smile on Kamehameha, because as Kaua retreats, Kilauea erupts. Clouds of cinder and ash fall on the fleeing warriors, wiping out a third of Kaua's forces instantly. Pele, the goddess of fire, has smiled on Kamehameha. He now has the upper hand on the island, but Kamehameha wants more. Now, to truly understand these warriors, I'm about to undergo a painful ritual central to the Hawaiian warrior, something that will change my life forever. There is a side of Hawaii you may not know, and this is it. The Hawaiian Islands are home to a devastating, almost mystical martial art called Lua. 
Westerners outlawed it. But Lewis survived, shrouded in secrecy. I think a lot of times, the best weapons are the most simple ones. And there's really nothing simpler than this. This is a Hawaiian war club. Kiko, my friend, tell me about this. Well, Perry, uh, it's called a, a Neva. It was used for close combat. All right, show me some of the moves that we would use to fight this. Well, if you were coming in, boom, I'm already starting to go down. And now he comes up, up. Oh, comes back up. I can take out your eye socket. Eye socket, boom, eye pops out, break the jaw, and it doesn't stop. It's almost like a blender. These clubs can strike with up to 200 pounds per square inch of force. That's more than 10 times what it would take to break your eye socket. If you get hit with this, it's over. So if I was to come at you with one of these, wham, block it, boom, right away. Notice the attacks. He transitions right into it. So he blocks with this, and he's not sitting there. He's not waiting for the next thing. He's coming down, coming up, coming across. Hey! Oh, oh. Oh, no. I mean, take home message with this. This really, fighting with this takes a lot of guts, man, because you got to get in tight on the guy, and you know if I don't hit him first, he's going to knock my bones. He's going to, he's going to, I'm going to die. So the Neva was for close in fighting, and the Lua Warriors had a very different kind of club for distance attacks. Oh, look at what that did to the tree. Now that's a big, solid tree. Imagine that being your shin bone or your kneecap or in the worst case, your skull. This is uh, an ikoi, or sometimes called a picoi, and it's actually a flying club. You can feel how hefty that? that. Yes. <laughs> you don't want to get hit with that. Weighing as much as two pounds, the picoi is made out of kawila wood or stone. The cord can be as long as 16 feet. In battle, the picoi can even be used for strangulation or to tie up an enemy. It looks kind of easy, but I can tell you're gonna have to know what you're doing. And I'm moving in on him, he's coming at me, I step in, rap! Beautiful. That was awesome. I got it, I can't believe I got it. Yeah, by the way, I don't know I don't know if you caught it, but everybody got really far away all of a sudden as if, oh, look, look at the knucklehead throw a big heavy club. Excellent throw. That was great, that was really great. This is a great weapon. It takes a lot of skill to use and it's got the potential to really hurt your opponent and take him off his base. And if you miss him, no problem, you still have your weapon. You can pull it in, boom, strike him again. Everything about these Lua warriors and their martial art has really impressed me. And now I've been given the rare opportunity to receive a mark that many of them share. I'm about to uh, get a traditional tattoo from Keone Nunez, who is a real he's a master of this. I've got a lot of tattoos all over me, and uh, all of them have meaning. This is going to have some great meaning, too. Tattooing originated here in the Polynesian Islands. Meant to mark status and genealogy, tattoos also help guard spiritual and physical well-being. So, Keone, we're going to use traditional uh, instruments, aren't we? Right. Um, the traditional instrument throughout Polynesia is uh, one like this. Wow. And that's actually made out of uh, ivory. It's amazing. This is a very unique opportunity for you to actually feel how our ancestors, chiefs, warriors, um, actually felt as they went through the process. Using a combination of kukui nut oil and modern ink, getting a traditional tattoo is like participating in an ancient ritual. This needle's getting driven in, I can feel it. But I think the pain is part of the ritual, you know? Hawaiian tattoos have hidden meaning and power. And unlike how we choose modern day tattoos, it's up to the artist to pick the design. Harry, what I'm doing on your legs right now is a shape called makaihe. Makaihe is spear points. The fact that it's facing downwards um, means that as a warrior, you have the ability to, to do what is necessary, but you come peacefully. Yeah. If it's facing upwards, it's a sign of aggression. Those three, three lines are a design that shows patience, endurance, longevity. Makes perfect sense, man. Nothing's accidental, nothing's just purely for a look, you know? You can't just walk in off the street and get a tattoo like this. 
and it's truly an honor that Kaoni would consider what I do worthy enough to share permanently in his culture. So wherever he goes in the world now, uh, he has to defend who we are because we are on him. And that's actually got a lot of meaning. It's, this is being put on me and it goes to my grave. Wow, man. And there's something else that Kaoni gives me as he finishes. This is yours. You take this home. You bury it or you burn it. As part of the process, any blood I spilt while getting the tattoo is carefully collected for me. It contains your life essence. It contains your, your DNA. It doesn't belong in the trash. You don't belong in the trash. Your ancestors don't belong in the trash. And that's why we give it to you. Hey, man. Thank you. I almost don't need to see it. I don't need to see it. I feel it. I know exactly what it is without looking at it. You know what I mean? It's almost the appearance isn't in, in a way really not as important as what just took place. Seventeen ninety one, King Kamehameha controls the Big Island of Hawaii. Now he sets his sights on the rest of the Hawaiian Islands. But first. Prophecy says he must build a temple to the god of war. So he constructs this massive 200-foot-long monument, literally called the Hill of the Whale. A prophet from Kauai predicted that uh, if he built this temple, uh, that he would gain the spiritual power, the mana, uh, necessary to conquest the entire island chain. But the temple requires the blood of a high chief. So Kamehameha kills his cousin, a rival chief, takes the body to the top of the temple where it's cooked and the flesh removed, leaving behind only the bones. Hawaiians believe that the mana was the divine spiritual power bequeathed to the chiefs directly from the gods above. Right. Within their bones, that mana existed. So if they held their bones, they could assume their that power. Mana, that power, exactly. In one fell swoop, Kamehameha has satisfied the gods, taken sole possession of the big island of Hawaii, and set up this temple as a launching point for the conquest of every other island in the chain. Hoogie! 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 But to be a force beyond his home island, we're moving now, he'll need hundreds of war canoes. Can you hear it cutting through the water? Imagine being a warrior back then, paddling with your brothers, island to island, knowing that when you get to where you're going, you gotta fight. In the time of Kamehameha, canoes could hold up to 100 warriors and were used both for sea battles and as troop transports. Kiko, now what, what are these made of? Um, in the old days, the hull, the black part, would be carved from a single log of a koa tree. So the whole hull, whether it's 20 feet or 80 feet long, wow. would be carved from one log. That's amazing. War canoes could be up to 80 feet long. Combining two hulls into one vessel, they made for a more stable craft, with space on the platform in between to hold a king, weapons, and warriors. With that load, the vessel can still move quickly, since only a small part of the canoe touches the water to create resistance. That's what's amazing about this too. Unlike a lot of other ships, because it's an outrigger like this, I can switch hands right or left and still get in the water. To navigate these vessels, Hawaiian chiefs used the stars, as well as other surprising ways to judge ocean currents. They have a set pattern, and the really experienced guys can feel them sitting on the deck by their um, testicles rolling around in their scrotum. <laughs> oh, but I've learned a lot of cool stuff. That's probably about the craziest thing I've ever learned. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Navigating by the seat of our pants. To modern ears, that kind of sounds crazy. But in the middle of the ocean, you do whatever it takes to survive. What a day, man. 
Three o'clock. There's a whale out there. Where? Almost to the horizon. Yeah. Oh, okay, they should blow us. Oh. Oh, man. Unbelievable. We came out of the water. What kind of whale is that, uh, uh, Kiko? Do we know? It's a humpback whale. It's a humpback. It is a humpback. Oh, there he goes. This is the first time I've ever seen anything like that in my life. And these are just amazing animals. And he's right there. February 1795. Kamehameha begins his campaign for island dominance. With 12,000 men and 1,200 war canoes, he sets sail. His first stop, Maui. It was the most impressive military force these islands had ever seen. The outcome would be shocking because the weapons Kamehameha had on board would change Hawaiian warfare forever. Fire the hole! Seventeen ninety-five. Prophecy states that King Kamehameha is destined to unify the Hawaiian Islands. He will do so through military conquest. His warriors are masters of the ancient Hawaiian martial art of lua. But there is a new weapon that will change Hawaiian warfare forever. 1778. Europeans arrive on the Hawaiian Islands. They bring with them gunpowder. This is a British four-pound naval cannon. With this, Kamehameha would change Hawaiian history. Oh, you do not want to be on the other end of that, that's for sure. Oh, you see the, the muzzle blast, the smoke, the fear factor that something like this would put on people? Oh, it's big time. Psychologically, it, it'll cause people to recoil and try and get away. The bronze cannons Kamehameha acquires can fire cannonballs a half mile. But they're heavy and designed for mounted use on a ship. So the Hawaiians designed sleds that turn these naval cannons into land-based artillery. And a crew of warriors could pull a sled like this across grass, sand, or even rocks. So, but this sled originally, guys, was used to go down hills and, and yeah, stuff like that, right? A little longer and a little lighter, obviously, but uh, they came up with that idea. That's pretty smart, man. So we got a naval gun here on top of a Hawaiian invention. What would they fire out of this? Well, of course, there's always the, the shot, the normal cannonball type thing, but they had a real limited supply of those. So that normally they'd use whatever they could find. One of the classics is something called Ili Ili. Right there in that bucket is a good example of that. Basically, Ili Ili is simply river stones that are smooth. Rocks. Uh, yeah, rocks. I kind of wish today we were able to do that with some of our rounds. Yeah. And come up on the ground. It'd be kind of cool to be able to get bullets off the ground, but we can't, you know, but these guys had that. That's pretty, again, ingenuity right there, man. All right, now what do we got here, guys? Now, what that is, is that is a canister. Very simply, it has a wooden plug in the base. Yep, right you can here. See right there. It has a stiff paper core or a casing yep. on the outside. Yep. It's filled then with Ili Ili in the front and then wrapped in a linen wrapping. I could feel it in there, too. Yeah, it's in there. With this ammo, the cannon acts like a shotgun and has an effective range of up to 300 yards. Fire the hole! Nice! Oh, check that out, man. Oh, oh, oh. I mean, look at that. These are all spots where these stones would have literally ripped into you and killed you. This is a great example of the devastating power of a gunshot wound. Now, of course, we can't shoot a human being, so we're shooting at banana tree stumps, but you can see the damage as it goes in, and if you look around the back, the exit wound is way worse. This is you. This is your leg, this is your arm, this is your torso. A round is coming in, pushing its way through with the cavitation and gas, and then blowing it out the back. This is a great example of the power of this, and basically, we're using gunpowder and rocks. This cannon launches Ili Ili at more than 600 feet per second. And Kamehameha had up to 12, just like it. Fire a hole! Wow! Oh man, what a thump. I would say there's nothing left of this guy. These are headshots. That hits you in between the eyes. Guess what? You're finished. Computer shuts down. Now you might think with this weapon, that Kamehameha would easily win any battle. But his enemies across the water had the exact same technology. This had truly become an arms race. 
And Kamehameha understands better than anybody that winning that arms race will determine Hawaii's future. He hires European experts to train his men on the cannon and musket. Then, he begins his conquest. February 1795, Kamehameha takes his first step toward conquering the Hawaiian Islands, Maui. Kamehameha invades with thousands of warriors and hundreds of war canoes, easily overwhelming the Maui forces. Kamehameha has now expanded his kingdom. Before he's done, his warriors will leave their mark on all of these islands. Check this out. I've never seen anything like this before. This is the Pololu, a Hawaiian spear, and it's 14 and a half feet long. But there's two things you need to know about this weapon. One, it's been splintered and it was three feet longer than this, making it close to 18 feet. And two, this is at least 200 years old. The Polulu and these other ancient weapons date to the time of Hawaiian unification, and they are family heirlooms of the descendants of Kamehameha himself. Well, these have been handed down uh, in our family. Man, what a lineage. Now, how old is this one? They're all 200 plus years. All of these weapons are 200 years old or out. At least. At least. What a great feeling. And, and there's uh, definitely something to the uh, the notion that you're picking up a, a weapon that's 200 years old. And it's still, this is still capable of doing some damage. Do, doing the work. Yeah, I mean, there's, that's, that's, that's all there. Similar to the shark tooth weapons, this small but deadly weapon is actually made of bone. Wow, that's cool. And it keeps, and you lever it in. Yeah. And this, you can come in and then just... Amazing. And a warrior going into battle didn't just carry one of these weapons. He carried the spirit of the person who made it and all those who used it before him. There goes with it the, the spirit of your ancestors. Now, if you kill somebody with it, you capture their spirit into that weapon. Wow. So not only so are, you, are you inheriting the people the, who used it, but even the, the foes that it took down. Right. So you, it's more than just a spear and a piece of wood. So these weapons had physical as well as spiritual power, and that multiplied their effectiveness in a formation. This is the Kahalui. This is the Crescent, and this has taken individual warriors and turned them into a unit, and they are ready to fight. Now, they're getting ready to transition into the Kulakawa, the Wedge. Look at how the guys are changing, and they're coming together. Notice, they're kind of getting a rhythm going. And keeping forces in disciplined formation during the chaos of battle, a chaos that is now elevated by gunpowder, is key. Another command, getting ready. Throw the spears, watch what happens. Boom, go to the enemy. Seventeen ninety-five, Kamehameha has conquered Maui. Next. He captures the islands of Lanai and Molokai. But he's about to face his biggest challenge yet. Because next is Oahu. Under the leadership of Chief Kalanikapule, Oahu is the most powerful kingdom in the Hawaiian Islands. Kamehameha is determined to bring it under his control. So he sails for Oahu with 1,200 war canoes and 12,000 warriors. But when they hit the beach, they encounter no resistance. That's because Kalani Kapule has set a trap. So far, King Kamehameha's forces have met little resistance. That's about to change. They're about to engage in the most epic battle of Hawaiian history. April 1795, with control over five of the eight main islands, Kamehameha's campaign to unify Hawaii has reached a critical juncture. Kamehameha's forces arrive on the shores of Oahu, near modern-day Waikiki. The defending Oahuans and their king, Kalanikapule, are waiting inland at the mouth of the Nu'uanu Valley. There, Reinforcements wait to surround and trap the invaders inside the high cliff walls. Kamehameha, starting without his cannons, takes the bait, marching straight into the Oahuans' first line of defense. The 
two forces clash. This has now become vicious hand-to-hand -hand Hawaiian combat. But there is one more element to this battle, artillery, and both sides have it. But Kamehameha has more cannons, more muskets, and better training. As expected, Kamehameha's forces push the Oahuans up into the valley. Here, they've lined cannons high in the cliff walls above. They fire on Kamehameha's forces below. Meanwhile, Kamehameha's cannons make landfall and speed their way toward the heart of the battle. Kamehameha's forces pull the cannons up into the valley. They shell and obliterate the Oahuan lines. To eliminate the enemy's firepower, Kamehameha already has a strike force working up the other side of the valley. They silence the Oahu with cannons, virtually paralyzing the rest of the Oahu warriors. It broke the back of the Oahu army, and from there, Kamehameha's troops gained the advantage and... And they never let it up. The Oahuans retreat, trying to fight as they battle uphill. The valley that was meant to trap Kamehameha has now trapped his enemy. Kamehameha presses the advantage, driving the enemy higher into the valley, but they're quickly running out of room. The Oahuans eventually stop here, at the cliffs of Nu'uanupali, and with the abyss at their backs, they make a final stand. It's a really kind of a sobering thing to look at this and realize that so many people just, just plunged their death straight down. Some of them jumped off, some of them were killed and thrown off. Those chose to die, they jumped a couple hundred feet to their death. I don't know if I could do that. <laughs> Warrior after warrior plummets to his death. King Kamehameha's forces are victorious, and the battle is over. Decades later, a highway crew found more than 800 skulls at the base of this cliff. With Oahu now under his control, the final two islands eventually surrender to Kamehameha. He is now the first and only man to unite all the islands under one rule, earning him the title Napoleon of the Pacific. So what do you think this says, Elohe, about Kamehameha as a man and as, as, a, as a general, really, the fact that he was able to pull this off? Well, Kamehameha was many things. He was a warrior in his own right. He was also a great statesman. Kamehameha's rule is marked by peace at home diplomatic ties with foreign nations, including the United States. Less than 150 years after his death, Hawaii becomes the 50th state in the Union. It seems to me too that Kamehameha symbolizes or epitomizes, I should say, really the Lua warrior spirit. And that there is destructive capability, but there's also there's healing and, and, and kind of nurturing, so you can combine both of them. That fierceness, combined with great humanity, is the core of Hawaiian warrior culture even today. Hawaiian warriors are not only fearless in the way they fight, but in how they express their love and respect for each other. <laughs> and you can see that in how they greet each other and say goodbye. Two strong presences meet face to face, eye to eye, nose to nose, the sharing of a breath, and then a simple hug. Mahalo boys, thank you. It's a cultural practice, but in the faces of these guys, I see something that transcends everything else. You guys are really, uh, silly word, but you guys are special guys. I think you probably know that. And if I wasn't here doing this, I'd be in Afghanistan. The group, the dynamics, it's just like being on a Special Forces A team. So don't forget that. They never let each other down. That's, that's the only way to get through life. So thanks, guys. Whether it's today or a Hawaiian battlefield 200 years ago, camaraderie, courage and a cause worth fighting for will always mark the heart of a warrior. Fence, so deadly that during European settlement of these islands, 
the practice of Lua was outlawed, and it was forced to survive in secrecy. So here I come in. Here you come in. Oh. Come, Gina. How about this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> luckily, luckily I didn't get hired for my looks. <laughs> so, what are, you, what are you guys laughing at? <laughs> but the takedown is just the beginning. Once immobilized, a Lua warrior could methodically dislocate or break every bone in a victim's body. Okay, so if I'm coming to you like an idiot, yeah. hey man. First thing you do is grab <laughs> Oh, right there. And, and you may not realize how attached to pain a little finger is. Yeah, yeah. when he was that and bends back, I, I, I'm giving up. That <laughs> really hurts, man. Okay, now so he's moving up the chain. Now he's got my wrist, and now he rolls it over. What happens is when he takes that joint over, I've got to follow it. If I don't follow it, I'm breaking the joint. So I'm going to go right there. He's got it. Oh, I hate that one. He just broke my arm. And down I go. It's body mechanics. It's basic body mechanics. Bodies are supposed to bend some ways, and some ways they're not supposed to bend. So this is how these warriors could kill with their bare hands. And it's this martial art that will dominate these islands for centuries. The islands we now call Hawaii are colonized in the 4th century. And for 900 years, these first Hawaiians lived mostly in peace. But that's about to change. Because in the 13th century, warriors from Tahiti arrive on the big island. They bring with them warfare and human sacrifice. The islands form into separate kingdoms. Conflicts erupt throughout the island chain. The region has been transformed from peace to war. And that transformation is about to create an amazing warrior culture. Whoa. One with a type of skill I've never seen before. I think every culture has used a spear, but the Lua warriors took it to a whole new level. And what made these guys great was what they did when one of these was coming straight at them. Because you gotta know the guy to the left or right of you is gonna protect you. You know, you gotta care almost more about your guy to the right and left and your buddies than yourself. And that's kind of what this is training, man. Go, 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 go. 18th century. The Hawaiian Islands have endured five centuries of intertribal conflicts. But a new warrior is coming. One who will end the warfare and radically change Hawaii's destiny. And to truly understand this warrior, I'm going to experience an ancient test of bravery. I jump out of planes for a living. That looks freaking crazy. A remote outpost in the Pacific. A land born of fire and water. Hawaii. But what you might not know is that Hawaii is home to a unique and absolutely fascinating warrior culture. Their fighting style was considered so dangerous that it was outlawed. Now, I'm getting a rare look into one of the world's most secret warrior cultures. Hawaiian warriors used activities like surfing to test their strength and courage. But they had a sport that was even more dangerous, holua. With this sled, they could basically surf down a mountain. I jump out of planes for a living? That looks freaking crazy. Yeah. But this is much more than an extreme sport. Holua is so dangerous that it was considered a type of ritual self-sacrifice for warriors. As a test of bravery, Holua riders hurl themselves down slopes more than a mile long. How important was this to them? It was very important because it was a way of proving their value, their worth. This is just grass, but they did it on rock. Right. You know, groomed right. stone pathways. And the whole point was to make the bottom. The average Papaholua sled is 12 feet long, but only three to six inches wide. It can travel over 70 miles per hour, and everything on it is built in pairs, emphasizing the Hawaiian concept of duality and balance. Have you ever done anything like this? No. This is Hawaiian spear catching. Nice, man. In ancient times, when a Hawaiian chief 
called an ali'i, would come ashore in war or in peace, the locals would throw at least one spear right at him. Your, your mana or your power as an ali'i and your worth was measured how well you did with the pairing or catching of the spear. Wow, so right then when you get on shore, right then. you're tested. These warriors are members of a Lua fighting school called Apa, and they're going to show me how to eventually run straight at an airborne spear. Even if you block them, sometimes it's still going because of the momentum. Yeah, it's right, right, because yeah. it's still on that trajectory where it's yeah, going to get you. Yeah, okay, so okay. It's got to go on the off, off, yeah. offline. Yeah. Offline. Offline. Yeah. Yep. And learning the basics helps both mind and body, because facing down even a training spear is really about controlling fear. The better, the better ones I did were the ones that I didn't really think too much about. I just did like as soon as I started thinking about it, you get a little slower. The greatest warriors could dodge, deflect, or catch up to 12 spears at a time. And these are training spears. The real ones were sharpened to a deadly point. But for me, just catching one is a big challenge. You ready there? Yeah, yeah let's yeah. go. Pretty good, actually. That's all right. <laughs> I got lucky. You could have been the other way. I could have went like this. Bam. So that's how you get good, man. Train. But deflecting and even catching spears isn't enough. To really succeed at this task, I've got to run directly into a hail of spears. With, with that theory, I guess I guess we'll have to make an honorary member of our PA. <laughs> <laughs> I got a long way to go for that. <laughs> These guys are being nice. It's, you know, it's fun to be around guys like this. These are kind of my kind of guys. You know, you you have to have camaraderie in a fight. I felt like a wall of power coming at me there. Yeah, we call it mana, and that spiritual energy put out by the warriors actually goes feet in front of them, you know, so we have a bunch like this, it extends 30, 40 feet and you can feel it in your body and your hair stands up on your neck, you know, and that's uh, the mark of uh, a warrior. But to truly understand the Hawaiian warrior, you must first understand the concept of mana. In Hawaiian, mana loa means the great power. It is a spiritual force of supernatural origin, a power that flows through all things. Mana can be placed in a person, uh, a place, a holy shrine, or a thing. So mana it, can, can, it can be in things too. It can be in things, yeah. Mana is an underlying concept of all Hawaiian way of thinking. It is a spiritual force, the life force. And that spiritual force is transmitted into a unique and absolutely brutal martial art. This is Lua ancient Hawaiian martial art. It's also known as the art of bone breaking and joint dislocation. That's a back break right there. Yeah. The secret to Lua is to let the enemy make the first move, then knock him off balance with paralyzing nerve strikes. In fact, the word Lua means to strike the second blow. I'm stepping into the circle of death here, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> they know it's coming, I'm sure. <laughs> Go straight, right? So I come in. I, oh, nice. Boom. Done. That was nice. You would be making a huge mistake <laughs> if you underestimated this guy. You think, oh, come on. What could he do? He just crushed me. And he was nice. Can we walk through that slowly sure. so you can kind of point out what you do? Sure. We unbalance you first and then go straight to the joints or to a vital spot. Boom. So I'm good with the C block. Right away. You yeah, can he's, see. He's twisted. I'm, I'm out in big of position. trouble. Right? I'm not, I can't counterattack so much. Nope. I mean, that's, yeah. yeah. It, would, it would be difficult, you know. And if he comes in with his right leg as well. Oh, yeah. Much better. Even better. And boom. Look at that. Right there. If you get hit. Right there. Here. Anybody who's done any tie boxing and you get these kicks, it just shuts down the leg. Oh, done. Done. This is really a deadly form of self defense. It is one of the most isolated places on Earth. A remote outpost in the Pacific. Thousands of miles from the nearest continent. And it is home to a martial art that was kept secret, outlawed, and nearly vanished. 
My name is Terry Shepard. I'm a Green Beret sent on combat and training missions around the world. But I'm part of a long line of elite warriors tested in battle. And the only way to reveal their weapons and tactics is to experience them myself. Yes! I'm about to search for the heart of the Hawaiian warrior. You may think of these islands as paradise, but deep in Hawaii's past is a surprising warrior culture. Today, the secrets of that culture are closely guarded, and I'm about to witness something few people get to see. Look at these guys. This is an ancient greeting, meant for a visiting chief, both to honor and to challenge. What they're doing is also finding out what your intentions are. Why are you here? You know, and if you come here with good intention, they honor you. If you come here with something else, they're ready for an attack. Man, I don't think I've ever seen anything like that. Look at these guys. This is an ancient greeting, meant for a visiting chief, both to honor and to challenge. What they're doing is also finding out what your intentions are. Why are you here? You know, and if you come here with good intention, they honor you. If you come here with something else, they're ready for an attack. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that. I felt like a wall of power coming at me there. We call it mana, and that spiritual energy put out by the warriors actually goes feet in front of them, you know? So we have a bunch like this. It extends 30, 40 feet, and you can feel it in your body, and your hair stands up on your neck, you know? And that's uh, the mark of uh, a warrior. But to truly understand the Hawaiian warrior, you must first understand the concept of mana. In Hawaiian, mana loa means the great power. It is a spiritual force of supernatural origin, a power that flows through all things. Mana can be placed in a person, uh, a place, a holy shrine, or a thing. So mana it, can, can, it can be in things too. It can be in things, yeah. Mana is the underlying concept of all Hawaiian way of thinking. It is a spiritual force, the life force. And that spiritual force is true. It is one of the most isolated places on Earth. A remote outpost in the Pacific. Thousands of miles from the nearest continent. And it is home to a martial art that was kept secret, outlawed, and nearly vanished. My name is Terry Shepard. I'm a Green Beret sent on combat and training missions around the world. But I'm part of a long line of elite warriors tested in battle. And the only way to reveal their weapons and tactics is to experience them myself. 
Yes! I'm about to search for the heart of the Hawaiian warrior. You may think of these islands as paradise, but deep in Hawaii's past is a surprising warrior culture. Today, the secrets of that culture are closely guarded, and I'm about to witness something few people get to see. Transmitted into a unique and absolutely brutal martial art. This is Lua, an ancient Hawaiian martial art, and it's also known as the art of bone breaking and joint dislocation. That's a back break right there. The secret to Lua is to let the enemy make the first move, then knock him off balance with paralyzing nerve strikes. In fact, the word Lua means to strike the second blow. I'm stepping into the circle of death here, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> they know it's coming, I'm sure. <laughs> Cross straight, right? So I come in, I, oh, nice. Boom. Done. <laughs> that was nice. You would be making a huge mistake <laughs> if you underestimated this guy. You think, oh, come on, what could he do? He just crushed me, and he was nice. Can we walk through that slowly sure. so you can kind of point out what you do? Sure. We unbalance you first, and then go straight to the joints or to a vital spot. Boom. So I'm good with the C block. Right away, you yeah, can he's, see. He's twisted I'm, I'm out of position. I'm in trouble already. Right? I can't counterattack so much. Nope. I mean, that's, okay. yeah. It would, it would be difficult, you know. And if he comes in with his right leg as well. Oh, yeah. But better. Even better. And boom! Look at that. Right there. If you get hit right there. here, anybody who's done any tie boxing and you get these kicks, it just shuts down the leg. Oh, done. Done. This is really a deadly form of self-defense. So deadly that during European settlement of these islands, the practice of Lua was outlawed and it was forced to survive in secrecy. So here I come in. Here you come in. Oh. Come in. How about this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> luckily, luckily I didn't get hired for my looks. So, what are you, what are you guys laughing at? <laughs> but the takedown is just the beginning. Once immobilized, a Lua warrior could methodically dislocate or break every bone in a victim's body. Okay, so if I'm coming to you like an idiot, yeah. hey man. First thing you do is grab <laughs> Oh, right there. And, and you may not realize how attached to pain a little finger is. Yeah, yeah. when he was that and bends back, I, I, I'm giving up. <laughs>